Hey, thanks for joining. I'm your host, Chris Gennaro. My co-host is Eric Risk, and today we have Oryx. How are you doing, guys? What's up? Hello. Okay, let's just jump right into it since we're uh, we're already talking. Um, let's let's talk about uh, the the new album. Uh, it's on transla translation loss. Um, lamenting of a dead world. Um, recorded during the pandemic, as everything that's coming out now. Um, and then talk about a little bit about recording it and your plans to go to Oakland and how that got messed up. And how that affected the recording of that this CD? Yeah, we yeah we were uh, originally slated to uh, record the album with Greg Wilkinson, um, Earhammer Studios in Oakland. Um, they were in the middle of uh, going into quarantine. I think it was March, uh, 2020, something like that. And uh, basically, um, you know, it was just looking worse and worse as every day went by, and um, so we. You know, we had to, essentially, we kept postponing with him, and it got to the point where we just, we just had to cancel and, and figure some out uh, locally, and, uh, but yeah, we ended up going with uh, Juggernaut uh, Studios here in Denver, um, and uh, Ben Romsdahl, he did a great job. He's a, a fantastic engineer, and um, uh, the space that he was renting at that time was just perfect for exactly what we're looking for, high ceilings and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, I just feel like we, we, um, we were able to capture, you know, what we wanted to, uh, to produce, you know, so it went well. Yeah, I think that the, the new album sounds, I always have a problem telling people new albums sound better than the previous one because they feel like the inference is that the other ones weren't as good. But I like the new album really has a fucking awesome sound to it. I appreciate that. Right on. Yeah, that, that's kind of... We were laughing about that too because we always say that going into recording like this is our strongest materials you know every band does that like yeah, this is their best else, yet yeah but, previous sucked <laughs> i mean it, what are you doing if the next thing isn't better yeah. you know so i think it yeah. for us it it's kind of the trajectory of this band anyways so it felt good to put out something we we're really proud of yeah. i thought it was interesting uh one thing i thought was interesting about the album is that you know you obviously you guys are uh, black and doom uh, I hear a lot of black metal influences, but the first, the opening song is actually the least doomiest thing on the record. And I thought yeah. that was like soup, soup kind of odd. So I was curious about the choice about yeah. that. Um, we've, we've had a long track record of, uh, of like writing songs that are in a way like anti-doom. Like we are in some, like as a doom band, in some ways we are like the antithesis of a doom band because there are a lot of riffs where we we feel like satisfied with a riff after like a short amount of time. And that's not, you know, that's not consistent with <laughs> with doom or with uh, a lot of sludge. And, and there's sort of, um, I feel like the way that we wrote Lamenting a Dead World I think the first song I really wanted to have the listener like really experience like like a punch in the teeth and then beyond that was like welcome and you're in you're in like like that it's like that that feeling that feeling when you get on like like the the roller coaster that's about to like make you puke your brains out that's what I wanted where you know, like when, when that when that metal bar comes down, and you're like, "Oh fuck!" Like I can't get off this. That's what I wanted for that first song, and then, you know, for the next forty minutes, we got you. That's that's what I wanted to essentially like strap in the listener. You know, here you go. Here's a little slice, and then here's the whole pie. Like after that, that that was really like, and it was intentional. Cool. Uh, you mentioned your bass player couldn't make it. Uh, I've seen a yeah. bunch of other interviews where I guess you were a two-piece for a while. Yeah. 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 We, um, but yeah. <clears throat> go on. Uh, yeah, we, we have been a two-piece. Um, I think we started as a three-piece. We we were a two-piece for many years after that, um, and then Eric joined. I think in 2018. I want to say we open for sleep and that was our first show together um but 
yeah, he's in coding school crazy boot camp program right now, and he has not been able to do any of the interviews. So we swear, like he's alive, he's out there. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a real person. Uh, he person. exists. We're yeah. not holding him captive. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Now you guys had had a bass player when you were in New Mexico, though, correct? Right. And right. We was, started with that. Yeah. And I assume that he just couldn't make the move then, or something. It, yeah, it was just kind of a mutual agreement that he had other things going on. He, well, was, he, he moved to Austin. He moved, and then he moved right no, he, after yeah, that. Yeah, uh, yeah we, in Las Cruces, we were like in a like a geographical oddity where it's 10 hours to, you know, San Diego, 10 hours to Denver, 10 hours to Austin. And so everybody growing up in Las Cruces moved to one of those cities essentially okay. at some point. So that was that was kind of like the, you know, he moved to Austin and um, I essentially absorbed all of his gear. I bought all of his, his, I bought his full bass rig and it was like, ah, fuck it. I'll just play through all of this, you know? Yeah. That'll be the basin. So, uh, so that we started, um, I mean, we originally started writing as a two piece um, and brought him on and then he moved. And so it was just sort of like a transitional thing. But um, I mean, we, we originally like, you know, the original inspiration was I, I was super inspired by like like the Hex album from Earth and things like that where I, I wanted to to write like wide open you know wide open like Americana doom that was just like you know not even not like um sleep or electric wizard worship at all like it you know it wasn't it wasn't really even Sabbath worship in a way like it was very like wide open. We were trying to write just like like introspective stuff, and it became heavier as we as we went on, and I, we just took on like like an addiction to heaviness. It really it really did become like, well, I think we can add more amps and get heavier. Like, and it was just like, you know, like, I need more, you know. Did, did, you, <laughs> did you move the band from New Mexico to Colorado because of the music scene in Colorado? Is that why you moved there? No? Yeah, it was. I guess a combination. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah it was a combination. We moved here. Um, I went to DU for my master's program, okay. but it was also it was easy to move here because of the music scene. Um, and yeah. we had toured through here a few times, and we played shows here in Colorado Springs, and we knew that it would be a good fit because the music scene is wild here. There's so many bands. Yeah. For sure. We also, sure. we actually had our, um, I mean, release. yeah, for Widowmaker, we had our record release yeah. in Colorado Springs. Um, and our close homie, Brian Ostro, um, who runs uh, what What's Left Records and actually is currently running What's Left Record Shop in Colorado Springs. Um, he put out our, um, our record while we were, like we were still in Las Cruces and yeah. kind of transitioning uh, to possibly moving up to Colorado and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and like he, he took a chance on us early on and our record release was in Colorado Springs and it was just, it was awesome. It was at the uh, uh, Flux Capacitor, which um, got shut down after a lot of the, like the, um, was it the, Go ship, uh, yeah. 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 like they, yeah, a lot of like venues started uh, getting shut down by the fire departments, you know, mm. throughout the country, yeah. and that was one of them that got taken out. Mm. Um, and we had, uh, we had strong connections, but yeah, yeah, I mean, like we we like we had like the best uh, the best time there. I mean, it was like like family. I mean, it wasn't like moving to a uh, like in a strange scene where we we had to sort of like integrate. Like it was like. We, we had already, you know, become family with everybody in that area. So it made sense to move up. Cool. Yeah. And uh, on the, the new album, Lamenting a Dead World, like thematically, uh, can you talk about, yeah, what, what is the album about? Um, I mean, uh, the album is an expansion on our previous album. Um, conceptually, we ba basically wrote like at this point of you know in time we've written like two back to back concept like concept albums that Stolen Absolution was essentially like like um, hyper focused on the concept of manifest destiny and the 
um, like the the intuition that comes comes with um, the like like man's need to to take you know and at, like with unrelenting force and um, lamenting a dead world is is essentially like like an expansion on that concept that um, which we you know had the unfortunate opportunity to see a lot of this like um, during uh, 2020 and and a lot of the just hyper like greed uh, a lot of the like the hoarding and the you know I mean th this stuff happened like within days you know of mm -hmm. you know the whole story. All, <laughs> the like pandemic, all of a sudden yeah. you can't find anything you know at the stores and, yeah, and it's, yeah. it's it's the like the ultimate like like shitty humanity like aspect that is just you know like you can kind of like people generally talk about ah people suck or whatever but then there's this level that is like no for real like when shit when shit hits the fan like kill or be killed it's like there's a line in the sand fucking like days in maybe hours in where it's like no this is like like load up your guns <laughs> yeah. you know get what you can from the store because it's done like everybody's you know and that's what like we had we had to you know experience that and and it's um i mean having a lot of like really serious conversations with friends about okay so when xyz happens we're going to meet, we're going to, what, you know, whatever, because we, we need to like, when the cell phones go out, all this kind of stuff, when the internet goes out, we're actually having these conversations about when we have no resources, what do we do? Because yeah, everybody's, yeah. you know, take, 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 at, you know, at the, you know, people are buying way more than they need because they're afraid sure. and as a consequence, everyone else suffers. Yeah. And so there's, um, you know, I, I mean, unfortunately, I had plenty of material to write about, and yeah. you know, it's funny because it was, I was, I was, uh, I was fucking infuriated. I mean, sure. I really, I really hated, um, you know, I I hated seeing human nature just at, at like even kind of like on on like what I would consider kind of like a small, you know, like oh the news reported something whatever, and people just go crazy. You know, and, and so I felt like, wow, like, you know, the, the fragility of our society is really exposed. And, uh, yes, for sure. So that, that really, like, that led into this idea of, of um, essentially, um, you know, the, the, like, the, the five stages of mourning over the death of what is postmodern society right now like we we are in this like perpetual like swan song like death curdle that um kind of yeah well and and well and i think that it reveals its head through like this this hyper capitalistic um society that really like we are at we are in such a fragile state at all times even when I don't know it it makes me it makes me hate the the good times even more because it's like well you know that you know that impending doom is is on the on the brink all the time because that is reality that's how our society is structured in this in this uh, you know in this exact uh platform you know and um I don't know. So I mean, uh, there's there's a lot there's a lot to write about. There's a lot that I will actually leave um, up to the listener. I do want sure I do want a bit of ambiguity ambiguity because I don't um, I don't really want to project um, like I I, w I want the listener to be able to also take what they want to take from from our album in in their own way and i i really hope that they're um they're able to take something and and ultimately be depressed enough to inspire a new world i mean it's really like that's my hope okay because because like you know as rosy as things may be in some in some ways i i think that uh you know 
people are shit and the world is shit and we should move to something better. Yeah, some, sometimes I, I think that some of these things are though preaching to the converted because like, you, you know, I, like I, I see a lot of these documentaries uh, like the David Attenborough thing on, on yeah. Netflix and, and I'm like, uh, I don't know that I'm the one that needs to watch this. Right, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm already thinking that way. <laughs> well, and that's, that's what, it, like, it makes me kind of happy when people are like, oh, this is, like, really dark. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, you're the, you're the person who should probably fucking hear this then. You know, like, I mean, that, that's kind of my response to everything has twisted into this, like, jaded morphed thing where I, I I want you to I want you to know that this thing is flawed that we live in like I I want you to to embrace that and and fucking want to change it so here's something the funny business or funny for me personally is that only a couple days ago I heard a friend of a friend was going to a prepper convention and I was like what the fuck is a prepper <laughs> convention yeah, yeah. And you, you're laughing, so you probably know. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it. So they, okay. they've, got a, they've got a bunker somewhere. And yeah. And like, here's and how so, you make a solar panel out of a soup can, you know, <laughs> whatever. So I, yeah, I, I, I wasn't sure what to think about people. I, you know, I guess I have a certain mindset about what a person like that is like. Sure. But then hearing you talk about it, I was like, Wow, is Tommy one of these people? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we always I have mean, a bag packed at all times, but like, well, I mean, know. I've got a go bag, but the the reality is that your go bag, you might end up in the woods somewhere, and I'll give you a week. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's that is the reality. You can have an AR-15, you can have all this, you know, soup cans, whatever you can carry, but most most people are are underprepared and and the reality is that we really need to restructure our, our society. Like we don't live in a society that benefits anyone at the bottom. And we're like fucking most of us are at the bottom and we're like, we're, you know, the, that, that class divide is aggressively increasing and it's going to end in a lot of bloodshed. It really will. And it sucks. And I'm not happy about it, but unless unless there is some level of like restructuring and at least consciousness about like hey what do you what society do you want to live in really like i want to live i like that's one of the things about denver too like i mean denver can be oppressive in a lot of fucking ways and and there's this that's not what you hear in the media that's not whatever i mean I don't care about that. It's super expensive. The, it's the day -to -day. really expensive there now. Really? It got popular. Yeah, it got popular and everyone moved out there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, and yeah. People, are, people are like really pissed off and aggressive here. And <laughs> There's a lot of good angry music here. Well, and that's, I, I think that that, does, that is a contributor. One of the things I think is funny is that like compared to the East Coast where somebody might just tell you, hey, fuck you, I don't like that people here are so like, there's like this, uh, it's like passive aggressive. So they're not willing to say what they really think or, or really get it off their chest. And I actually think that that's kind of in a bizarre way is healthy in the East coast. <laughs> yeah. that, like at least people are like willing to talk about it. Sure. But, sure. um, but, um, yeah, people are like bottled up, you know, and, and, um, it, it feels like a powder keg here. I mean, it really does. Okay. So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, yeah. No, I was gonna, so just getting back to the Denver music scene, you guys had uh, some people do some guest spots uh, on your album. Did you guys know, you, did you, you mentioned you knew some of those people before you moved out there? Yeah, we've known Ethan um, slash Many Blessings. We've known him for a long time. Um, Permanent Man early days, they played in Las Cruces where we're from. We connected that way um, and stayed in touch since then. Uh, and just another big reason of why we came up here too, because Permanent Man just always been such awesome 
dudes and inspiration and um, always wanted to be close to them too because they're just always putting out stuff that inspires you, you know. But um, they, yeah, we've known Ethan for a long time and then Paul and Erica, we met them as we lived here and in the past few years just really got to know them better and, um, you know, their music contributions to the world too were amazing and uh, but besides that, they're just really awesome people and really genuine good people. So we connected really well with them. And when we approached them about participating in this whole project too, and uh, from the start, it was just really fun and they made it exciting and they wanted to be creative in a different way for themselves too. So um, yeah, we've known them for a long time, but I think this working in this way was a really different experience um, since that was the first we've collaborated with the three of them in general. So. Also, yeah. I would mention too that uh, Ethan did the artwork on Widowmaker, which was yeah, like 2014. Yeah. So we worked with him yeah. in, in he, the he creative way too. Yeah, he does a ton of artwork. I'm familiar yeah. with artwork. Yeah. I've got the shirts and yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He did. He's, he's a good done artist. a bunch of our like shirts and and he's done um, several of our our releases. That yeah. He's, you know. He's he did all of the too. artwork actually for the releases up until. This yeah, right, right. Because yeah, yeah, Born in the Madness, The Last Solution, um, yeah. And then we what did we did uh, a split with Language, and that was the only one that he wasn't like involved on, uh, you know, up until our recent uh, release. So yeah, I mean, we've Ethan's been involved in in everything for us for you know since 2014. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. What's the story with the artwork for the cover? It sort of looks like a classical painting, but obviously it's all fucked up. Is it? Is that actually based on a classical painting? I should probably no, know this. I went it, to art school, but no, it, it is. It is. It is a fucking. It's like a modern. Uh, you were looking at the artwork of a modern genius. Um, Ettore Alla de Vigo is uh, an Italian painter that is. He's incredibly gifted, um, and he's, uh, I mean, he's, he's incredible. He's, uh, I, I would consider him one of the better or best uh, surrealist um, artists of our, of our modern day. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, I mean, I, I consider him a little bit unknown, uh, you know, in, in terms of the broad sense uh, for surrealist artists, but he's, um, you know, we, we had a huge connection to his artwork and, and um, fortunately he was, I mean, he was fantastic to work with and, and uh, talked about like his love for Black Sabbath and, and whatnot when we, you know, we were in conversations with him. So it was like, wow, cool. Like we can really actually connect with this person, not just sort of like, you know, move, move his artwork and uh, under our umbrella, like we, we actually feel like a strong connection. Um, to him for that. How no, did you I, discover his artwork? How did you uh, discover it? Yeah, through the internet. Yeah, okay. it was, uh, you know, yeah. it's Instagram and, and just connecting through that way. But, um, you know, and we, we got into conversations with him and um, he was just very, like, very warm. He's very, very warm. Yeah, he's open. Yeah. Open-minded, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, we, we recently did, um, through Heaviest of Art, we did uh, kind of like a joint interview um, with him. And um, it was incredible to hear his, like his breakdown on surrealism. Um, he essentially kind of, you know, taught like a masterclass on surrealism. I mean, it was really I, something that I consider like a, a blow away, <laughs> like, you know, like a, a gift, you know, <laughs> from, from him to society. Like it was, it was great. Like, I really, I really enjoyed reading his words. Uh, He's a very uh, humble man too. Yeah. Like he, I, yeah. you can go back and look at hundreds of paintings he's done and, and you can just see the immense talent that he has. But to him, I mean, it's just natural to him. He just wants to do that. And um, he loves doing yeah. that and he will continue to do it for the rest of his life. But it, yeah, the, the, you can see the inspiration. The yeah. painting that we bought was, or or, or we licensed was um, the Solitude of Judas. Uh, it was the yeah. title, and um, in his words, it's it's basically like um, like a breakdown on on agnosticism and 
you know, in this, like, you can see, like, the perils of light and dark, and there's, like, you know, spermia and skulls, and there's everything included where it's this, the ultimate, like, life and death um, uh, portrayal. So I that's really felt like you had a, a connection to it. So that's pretty cool. So you, like, usually when you get an album cover, it's like you get the artist to do something, and then you just trust that it's going to be good. But I, it sounds like in this sense, you saw the artwork first, and you were like, that one is the what, yeah. that's what yeah. I want. And we, we actually did sit on the artwork for a year and a half yeah, we um, found it before the full album was written. Yeah, and and that was that was yeah. something that was hugely different for us as well. Is that like we found this artwork and and loved it and were attached to it and everything and and we went through the process of of licensing it and and wanted to, wanted him to have the credibility and everything that you know so that it was just legit and everything and in that way. But um, I mean I. I had many days where I sat and wrote lyrics with that artwork right in front of me. And it was just like an incredible inspiration. That's cool. I, I, it's just, it's always funny to me because like I'm old, obviously. And I just remember like going into the music store when there was no internet and you literally picked out albums because of the album cover. Yeah. Right. or it looked similar to something. Um, so, you know, I, I do like it when I hear bands trying to make that connection with the artwork because that's something that I feel like is getting lost a little bit. And yeah. it's sad for me that it's getting lost. And Yeah, yeah, I can feel that. I, I, I totally agree with you. I Although the one good thing that's coming out of the internet is it's becoming a lot easier to get in touch with these people and to find out stuff like that. I mean, yeah, it, it, it was kind of weird for me being in like a lot of uh, Giger groups, like Giger fan groups and stuff. Right. And, you know, I, I think that he just did that stuff because he liked it. Like, I don't think that those dudes, like be it Celtic Frost or any of those other people, like had that type of money to pay for a guy of that stature, I, I think that it was like, it was a deep discount, you know? Yeah. I, mean, I just it, get that sense. Yeah. Well, and that, that's, you know, Blood Incantation uh, licensing Bruce Pennington. Uh, and, you know, there's like, there's just, I really think that there is an actual connection um, that is, it's rare but it's it's a really really incredible thing when you strike that connection with with um, an artist and go hey our music matches your artwork like let's let's talk let's see if we can figure something out like that's that's something that we felt very very deeply and genuinely with uh, Ettore de Aldo de Vigo he's he's you know he was just speaking our language and it was the the fact that you know, he said, uh, you know, he said what he said in, in the Heaviest of Art uh, interview where he kind of broke down a lot more of like the details about that, where that was, that was like confirmation after the fact where we're like, wow, like he, like we actually, you know, we surprisingly, yeah, we like we're actually ideals. very, very similar, but, yeah. but up front we felt like, hey, this is this, you know, we, we feel a connection, you know, whatever, like, and and then after the fact, even two almost two years later, you know, he he really was like, I mean, I, I feel like I, I could have written those words myself. I really feel like totally uh, connected to that. So, I, I, yeah, it's it's just crazy. I mean, some of those things just fall in line. The universe speaks. I don't know. Um, one thing I, I was interested in. You know, obviously you haven't had a tour for the new album, but even even the past albums, uh, playing as a two-piece or a three-piece, you guys definitely have double guitars on a lot of stuff. Yeah. And and so how do you guys do that live? Do you have a, do you have a track that you're playing with? And if so, do you then play the solo or do you play the rhythm and let the solo? How do you guys work that? Actually, yeah, I, I, yeah, totally. That, that is, I really do appreciate that question. Uh, we, 
in our, in our effort to be a two piece and never hire a basis, which we had to, it was just, it got too, too complicated. Uh, but I, I used to loop and, um, and I would, I would loop and, and solo and, and, um, that actually has a lot to do with how I build riffs, um, how I write. Um, I tend to, I tend to write, you know, a bass, like a, not like a bass, but like a, a basic version of, uh, of a riff. And then um, I'll build like six or seven layers over it and try and comprise chords that seem to make sense from all of it and, um, and figure out the least complicated way to do that. But, uh, but we, we did used to, uh, we used to loop live. Um, it was hard. <laughs> doing that really in vocals is a fucking pain in the ass. <laughs> that sound, yeah, really involved because you're like, yeah, tap dancing with the loop yeah. pedal and then. Well, the yeah. Exactly. And, and what, and like. And one no or one B yeah. is off and it's. The whole thing is off. Just, so it's not, it's not pre-recorded. Oh, in no. the sense that you've you've recorded it ahead of time, it's it's loop no. live. It's a loop yeah. pedal. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. I I, I yeah. mean I know what a loop pedal is. I just want to make sure that we're all. <laughs> well, it's no. I, I mean, and you know, there there we would play the samples live as well, but uh, through you know through the same loop pedal. But it would be, uh, but yeah, like our layering and stuff. Um, you know, and I've. I've definitely been like stunned by the works of like Chelsea Wolf, you know, seeing her live where she loops guitar and then she has a separate pedal board that she loops the vocals as well. Like, I mean, cer certain acts can get away with, with, you know, with like an extra level of complication that I would be kind of scared to jump into. <laughs> so uh, like, kudos to Chelsea Wolf uh, for that. But like, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we were doing for a while. Um, and honestly, like bringing on a bassist was, was a breath of fresh air because, you know, this, this music is supposed to be cathartic, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working, you know, yeah. uh, but no, um, uh, writing with Eric was, was like, uh, hugely beneficial too, where, you know, the way that, uh, he, he's actually, he's a way better guitar player than I am. Uh, so for him to agree to uh, play bass for us is very nice of him, I guess. Uh, he's, he's doing like sweet picking and all this stuff that I, I just, I don't care about. I don't, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll readily admit to the world, I don't know it, I don't care. It's sure, fun. sure. Whatever, but, um, but yeah, no, and writing with him about, you know, like we're, we're going through different scales and, and figuring out how to really construct, um, you know, riffs that, that really inspire us and, and, and really feel like they're, there's like a movement that we're, we're excited about. Um, that's been like, that's been a really cool um, installation in the band that I really feel like has been, um, it, it makes me excited to, to continue to create, um, you know, when, when a lot of, when a lot of like the vocal end of it, like the, you know, like, or like the lyrical end of it is so dark, I feel like the, the riff end uh, of the equation is, is actually very inspiring and kind of keeps me, uh, keeps me interested and, and engaged and, and uh, uh, even obsessive about it, you know. Sure, sure, sure. Um, you mentioned in, in a prior interview that I, I was watching that you share rehearsal space with, with a bunch of bands. Are they metal bands or, and people we might know? Uh, yeah, uh, well, we used to. Um, and, and we left during the COVID, uh, era. I mean, it was, it was kind of like, we didn't know a lot about COVID and, and we're in this massive practice space of like, I think 60 rooms. Yeah. Uh, oh, and, see. but yeah, we had primitive man down the hall. Um, right. they put had, us in the um, same hall because we're loud as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> they, had, they had the, uh, the the bands that piss them <laughs> off the most, uh, I think. Uh, all in one corner, one yeah. corner. Yeah. Um, I think one but, day we tried to practice at the same time. Yeah. And it was not going to happen. So we Too loud. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> it just sounds like, yeah. Uh, no, I, yeah, uh, Proto Man, Matriarch, um, 
uh, Blood Incantation, Spectra Voice, Chemist, Dreadnought. Damn, uh, everybody. That's yeah, like, I was I mean, going to say, that's like, like, like almost the who's who of Denver. <laughs> it, I mean, really, it was, it, and, and, uh, and, I mean, you know, we actually liked, yeah. you know, we liked it a lot, but we, um, we left essentially just because we didn't know if, um, and, and we were recording in August and we were essentially like, I mean, our attitude for real was let's record this album and then we'll get COVID and probably die. And we'll just fucking, that's great. We, we left our mark. Yeah. You know, we, we yeah. feel good about it and whatever. Yeah. And then there's like a grim reality after this. Yeah. And fortunately that hasn't happened. I don't know. Like, but that's, that it's was, the, the time for sure. yeah. that was, you know, that was, we, we were working with the information we had at the time and, and sure. We also were practicing next to Alien Ant Farm cover band, so uh, there was uh, even more motivation. To so if, if I ever move. wanted to kill myself, it would happen during that set. Uh, <laughs> no, I, didn't, I didn't know Alien Ant Farm was uh, still popular enough to warrant a cover band. <laughs> We've uh, been asking ourselves the same question. Yeah, like, weird. Who, like, These are the thoughts that keep me up at night. <laughs> yeah. It's it's actually the only song I think I even know by them, the Smooth Criminal cover. Yeah, it's back to sing that Smooth Criminal song that, over. That's and over. It was, oh, it was right after uh, a long set of like, Sublime <laughs> and then... Oh, God. I, I want to say uh, <laughs> let, let the Bodies Hit the Floor. <laughs> oh, like, shit. Okay, so Drowning Pool I mean, in was, the Mix. There you go. It, <laughs> <laughs> it was all all the hits, you know. I didn't like, even know all, what the hits. all the hits, all the new metal hits, <laughs> dude. Uh, and and those guys were relentless. They practiced a lot. They so. survived COVID too. All right, all right. All right. Yeah, they, they right unfortunately they survived COVID. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Uh, everyone's got their. Uh, yeah. They're listening. Yeah. <laughs> I, I fucking hate the term new metal. <laughs> hate the what? I hate the term new metal. I just, I oh, hate it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it just, do, do, you, do you hate the umlauts or is it the... <laughs> I, I hate that somebody was clever and thought they were clever by putting it as a U and then, and then every once in a while they, they actually assign that tag to a band I like, which then pisses me off because I, I you know, I, it's just... It's always used derogatory, no matter what. No matter what. Like, you know, I've never... And yeah. then... Yeah, but there's also like a bizarre revival. There is, there is. That's bizarre in my eyes. It, too. I think it's strange. Yeah, like I don't get well, it. I don't think I understand it. But yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm just coming up with reason because you know I know that a lot of bands, um, because there's such a crazy influx of like, now we're you know now that we can be vaccinated, we can have festivals and whatever, and shows and everything, and, and so everything's just, like, hitting the floodgates like a motherfucker, then yeah. all these bands from the 90s, or, it was like, early 2000s that I yeah. really, I was so happy that they were dead. <laughs> <laughs> and now they're all, they're all back playing festivals. Yeah, and, they uh, play festivals again. They need the money. Now they all, they all, yeah. And now, now I need to think of new ways to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 I'm gonna now. I gotta edit that out. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. It's not like this. It's not like this. Uh, yeah. The show is not monetized, so we don't have to worry about being demonetized. It, it doesn't matter. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I don't know. I'm a fucking elitist. Fucking I don't care. <laughs> Call me what you will. No, I, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's an interesting time. I mean, everybody's yeah. kind of coming back to, to shows like on every level, sure. Ma mainstream and underground sure. uh, alike cover bands and originals. It doesn't matter. Like everybody's coming back into this crazy, like influx and, um, and we're happy to put, uh, be a part of the circus, you know, whatever. Sure. So I was going to ask you, too, you mentioned just an offhanded comment and, and something else I was reading about how you used to book for a, a DYI venue in New Mexico. And I wanted yeah. to talk a little bit, you know, about that and find out, you know, just hear your experiences with that and, and you know, 
who you were booking, how that was going and everything? Yeah. What? Oh. Yeah. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what you said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. yeah um, I, um, I mean, my, my roots in, um, in DIY music and in, you know, both in heavy music and, and I mean, eclectic music, it, you know, all across the board kind of spans uh, into um, the, my upbringing for music in Las Cruces. And, and there were um, a lot of punk bands coming up and stuff that, you know, I got to play in and, and um, you know, that was like my introduction to touring. That was all that. And so, a lot of those people, um, you know, ended up uh, doing house venues and whatnot, and we ended up uh, landing um, this. I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. It was it was this this giant room, long ways um, in this like plaza of uh, like auto body shops and stuff. It was like a, like this industrial sector. It was it was a fucking perfect uh, spot for a venue because just it was kind of like an anything goes area uh, as far as music or you know whatever. People are probably dumping bodies. Who knows what the hell is going on? <laughs> so it was great and um, yeah, it was right on the train tracks and um, and so it, it we call it the train yard and. Um, that venue actually went on for five years. Okay, uh, that's a pretty good run. It was yeah. pretty good, yeah. And um, so, uh, yeah, like um, Chris Mason, whom I was in a band uh, with, uh, we were in a punk, like a garage punk band called Sheng Wang. Um, that was from way back in the day. Uh, we um, we kind of helped run that venue. And then um, that kind of evolved into various other people taking it over um and through the changing of hands it dissolved <laughs> as as it kind of does but um you know um it it had a it had a really good uh like a good like epic window in las cruces music history for diy music that um we had tragedy there we had like a bunch i mean we had a bunch of great you know, great shows. Las uh, Cruces is like that stop in the middle of nowhere that you kind of have to play yeah. to tour through to Colorado or to Arizona. Yeah. Um, Did you say it's... bombing? Bombing? What? You said tragedy. You definitely said tragedy. And then the other one. Yeah, we had, no, we had a uh, tragedy played. Uh, we had, um, I mean, we, we had a number of, uh, like, I mean, it was countless bands, like, um, I don't know. I, it's crazy. Uh, like, just every we, genre, we had we had festivals band, yeah. and stuff There's... there, and um, I mean, yeah. I actually got into amp repair because I was always fixing blown PA speakers and stuff. And <laughs> the the wall, you know, the wall voltage was so fucked up there that it would take out amps, and I would end up trying to repair them and stuff. And that that's how I kind of got into it initially. But yeah, I mean, it was like just. That was that was like our home, you know. So uh, and and we did have like early uh, primitive man shows there. Um, it was everybody everybody yeah. played there. Um, but yeah, um, that was kind of like our, you know, that was actually where we started Oryx as well. Um, and we, uh, Abby and I um, were renting a house just down the street, like literally like two blocks away, and uh, we would just walk over at like midnight and play at full volume until like three or four in the morning. And that's, that was like our rehearsal time because it, everybody would try and get on, you know, Google maps or whatever and organize when they're, and we're like, yeah, fuck that. We'll just be there way later than everybody. <laughs> we'll just show up at midnight and no one's going to be there and it'll be fine. Like, so we were playing, you know, we were playing a, you know, whatever, a hundred decibels plus, you know, at midnight, no big deal. And just, that was like our, our whole, our whole uh, world at that point. Like it was a great introduction to, um, you know, to the band. Yeah. But even, even in the tri-state area, the best clubs are in the shittiest areas. 
I mean, that, that's just it. That's just the way. It, I mean, it's got it's got to yeah. be that way because yeah. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nobody's gonna call the cops. You know, nobody's gonna complain. The the guy next door is like. <laughs> I mean, they they were like act like actively painting cars, or they had like you know the like the the earmuffs you have on for like or the ear yeah. whatever for like for you know gunshots and stuff like were super illegal. Just they were it, yeah and, yeah no they were like they were like definitely illegal chop shops and stuff, and I won't disclose anybody. <laughs> like, but you do that was, like kind of. But, like but we we're, we're in good company. It was great. Yeah, yeah. it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now, now that the album's out, what you you know, it, it's probably you're probably still a good two, three months off from from going back and certainly from doing a tour. But I, I mean, are, are shows even starting there? Shows are um, starting to pop up a little bit in the next month or so that we're seeing. Um, we might have some stuff brewing for later in the year, but you know, we've kind of still wanted to take it slow and sure. see what's going on sure. <laughs> because sure. things are changing um, every day. But yeah, we're excited to get this album out in a live setting. Um, and I think a lot of people are excited to see it too. Um, but you know, there's so many bands that released during the pandemic year that are mm -hmm. all trying to play at the same time too. So I think yeah. there's like yeah. an influx of shows, which is awesome, but it's kind of like, where do you want to fit in the flow of that and stuff? So we're, we're waiting things out a little bit, but um, we definitely have plans to take it out live. Cool. So are you doing any writing or is it just rehearsing and making sure that you can keep that album? Yeah. No, a we're, little bit of both, yeah. We're, I mean, that's, I got to admit, like, that's kind of more where my mind is. Yeah. Like, I don't, I love the album. I cannot wait to play it live, but also, like, I kind of expect to play, you know, I, I expect to tour more of the next album than, you know, like we'll probably tour like both albums simultaneously. You know what I mean? Like it, it's one of those weird things where it's like, how do you, you know, you, you can book whatever you want, but then it may or may not happen. Things are going to, you know, I mean, everybody feels like everything that's going to open right now and maybe it will and that's great but if it doesn't then you have to still play this back and forth game so i don't know sure sure we're you know at this point like i am more invested in the next thing sure, but sure. like i really can't wait i still can't wait to play this album live and then for like i mean obviously this is probably way down you probably don't even you might not even have an answer but when you record the next album will you go to Oakland to do it, or you think you'll stay in Colorado again? And do mm, it? Dude. That's a good question. Greg Wilkinson, <laughs> Great American Hall. Oakland, yeah. He's, I mean, he's, recording, he's recording this fucking huge amphitheater hall that I'm dying to record in. Okay. okay. If, we can, if we can make that happen, I, I will absolutely do that. Awesome. Okay. I don't know, but... But otherwise, we'll we'll record here and it'll be epic. Yeah, it'll be epic. <laughs> we'll make sure. No, cool. Yeah, you know, like last last time, I, you know, I I really, I think like one of the unexpected things that we benefited from was like the studio um, that Ben Romstahl was was recording in, like had access to like we got to record on. Um, like on a real Leslie that was shoulder height, um, which was great. Like that, that alone was like awesome. We also got to record on like a room size, like a 12 foot plate reverb. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. It was like really, uh, I think that's, that's like the first time I've ever even seen one of those. And, cool. <laughs> and to be able to record on that and yeah. like, and the, the sounds, um, by the way, like the sounds at the beginning of uh, of Contempt, uh, mm -hmm. in the beginning of the album, are turning that wheel on the plate reverb. Mm -hmm. and it's just like the the plate is like bending, and that mm -hmm. that's like the, that's how those uh, sounds were created. Like it's it's fully analog. Like it just sounds creepy as it is. Yeah, it does <laughs> for sure. And we're, we're just like do more of that. Like let's let's do all of that. You know. Yeah. So I, 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 if we do record it in Denver again, like I'm excited at the prospects of 
of having more equipment like that that we can kind of like take advantage of. So that, that's pretty, to me, that's really fun. Like, you know, cool. that could be fun. Cool. cool. Yeah. Um, anything else that you want to, you want to plug or uh, cover before we? <laughs> we have like nothing but love for translation loss. We're, we are like so stoked to be working with them. Um, you know, buy the album translationloss.com. Uh, I think there's a few left uh, for this run, and we're we're just um, we we feel at you know totally at home with with them, and and they're they're great. Um, and we we appreciate you guys inviting yeah. us to talk. I mean, it's yeah. Uh, th thanks for bringing us on. Yeah. Thanks oh. for agreeing to do it. Yeah. 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 I mean. And the West Coast ones are a little easier than the European ones, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, yeah. Ho hopefully you don't cut out, like, some uh, really important stuff that we said. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I think the whole yeah. thing will, will be in there. I, I, we'll, we'll do it straight this time. I nah, you're good. Sure. <laughs> cool. I, so let's, we'll wrap it up. Um, uh, yeah, we said it all. Thanks for thanks for coming on, and uh, yeah. you know we'll we'll look out for for the next thing, and and hopefully you guys will swing by the East Coast, and uh, and we can come out and see you live. Yeah, hoping to yeah. you uh, very soon. That'd be great. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Cool. cool. Thank right. you. Right. Thanks, everybody. Awesome.